Dear, dear friends, you who have asked about my health and why so many nights these recent months I've whiled away restless in my chair surrounded by these 30 golden lamps, I feel at last prepared to tell of when I met the master under the hill. We walked together through his dim and strangely decorated halls. The earthen floors absorbed our footsteps. The sulfurous tang of cooked smoke tinged my nose. I stared yet wondrous, surrounded by the decorations of his halls upon each shelf. Marvels! They grew fam more fantastical with each level we descended. The entryways, toys, and gadgets gave way to moving sculptures, machines, clockwork uh, things, they, uh, and uh, an engine tooting steam no larger than a cat. I, I, I saw on one shelf a pewter waterfall worked so cunningly that silvered streams appeared to dance and trickle over hammered stones. He stepped ahead, and in his voice as sooty as the air said, Your piece is just ahead, Lord. Ahead? What works are these? Unclaimed, he said. Forgotten, I should think. Incredible. I could only follow. I followed down another flight of stairs, turned a corner into a hall of armor. Armor? engineered as, as bridges, yet decorated like the crowns of kings, worked with such minute detail they seemed as if by fairy smiths. I cried out, Lord, what craftsmanship he only moseyed on. We came at last to a plain and wooden door surrounded, ringed with golden light. He stopped his knotty hand upon its handle said, you ready? Yes! He turned the handle, it clicked, and with the creaking door we found ourselves bathed in golden light. The viewing room was smaller than I expected. A rough-hewn wooden table in the front, eight torches all around with racks of goods, mine presumably, but others. Um, and beyond them, down a shallow passage, the red of the forge. It hummed, it pulsed, it seemed to breathe as if a living thing. He said, There, your lordship, dawn. What I saw on the table seemed at first a stick, and I thought myself a fool to have paid the price I paid and commissioned such an amorphous thing as dawn. I took a torch and stepped to and found it was a sword, a sheath in fact, a thing of iron, a half hand wide, cold to the touch, but ringed about with bronze, with vines and creepers, um, unbroke blossoms still with the cold upon them, uh, the things of night, of life entombed, still frigid in their docile state. Um, my eyes tracked upward, following one bloom, one blossom to the next. Um, I saw a, a ladybug perched uh, upon a tender stalk. I saw an unbroke twin chrysalis, as had once caught my eye in boyhood. I followed the vines, Yet further, the handle and hilt were bronze like the vines, but polished with a jeweler's cloth until they shone. I laid aside my torch, the embers dripping on the floor. It issued forth an inch of blade, a shining steel bright and lively as the sun, an evolution of the bronze and iron, a a brighter, harder, stronger, more lively thing than what encased it. Dawn. 
I had no other words. I, I turned to him and chuckled. Sir, I thought your fee a fortune, but angels could not ply such works as these. How comes a man who lives under the ground to know so thoroughly the dawn? He merely shrugged, but cast his eyes across the room, where on a shelf between two torches I spied a helmet, a, a steely dome embossed with gold. Behind my shoulder, he said, a, a, a mortal craftsman such as I could never cast the dawn until he could first forge the day. I, I took my torch, step two, and saw there was a, a gold vine wrapped around it, um, tenderly uh, hanging upon its edge. It, it was a grapevine, its bunches heavy, ready for their master's hand, uh, armored wings folded and cupped its cheeks, a, a feathered, uh, a metal feathered helm crowned its cap. It was a glorious thing. And in it, I saw the, the fullness of the day and realized that these were twin works, a mother and a child, such that in a universe where one exists, the other also must. And then I laughed. I laughed to realize it was this man's genius that filled his halls with unclaimed works. There was a man wedded to truth, a man who could not leave a tale half spoke. I said, sir, had I another fortune yet to give, I would not leave this help within your halls. The dawn is not complete without the day. His ever-knowing voice croaked, nor with it. I should have known. I should not have turned, but I am not wise. And my dim gaze, directed by the devil's hand, turned to look upon the ending of my tale. It was a six-flanged point of iron, a dull and lifeless thing like ash, a powdered blade upon which the lively torchlight refused to attach. It seemed not iron, not quite, too dark, not, not black, but like a frozen shadow, bent and twisted to a point. I reached to touch, but stopped, afeared. I saw it then for its wholeness. It was a spear, a brutal shaft. I saw in it the end of dreams, the endless shore, the long last dying breath of light. It was an ending thing. Not old, but, but, but outside time. A thing which seemed in, to have no place in a world of light and love and life. It was an ending tool, an after thing. A period upon the script of life. He said behind me, you know the name of that, of course. And so I did. Of course I did. You know it too. I yet held dawn in my hands. I turned to look upon the day, its glorious shining light, and felt the icy black spear upon my back. My friends, I left his home a richer man. I hold an art befit for kings. I hope it brings my children joy, but I'll not tell them the whole tale. I would that I had seen. I would not burden their hearts as mine to know, to feel with each passing moment that dark blade already arced into its murderous flight. I feel it arcing toward my heart. Dear friends, we have too little time. One day, one season born of nothing till to nothing we return. Take heed and revel in the dawn and day, for certain as the turning clock, the night will come.